Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Today we are lucky. We have a very special guest, Saad Ibrahim Gamard. He is a renowned translator of Rumi, and he is also a sheikh in the Mevlevi Sufi order or Tariqa. He is also the co-author of this book, the very valuable contribution, the Quatrains of Rumi. Without a doubt, the most thorough. Uh, every single quatrain is uh, translated with the original text, very literal and faithful. And this is one of the topics that we'll be talking about, inshallah, today. Uh, welcome. I hope you're well. Assalamu salamu alaykum, Muhammad Ali. Alaykum as wa rahmatullah. I have a series of questions. Some I have written, some sent in by readers. I'll just begin with the first one. Where were you born and raised? I was born in the United States, raised in the East Coast, raised a, a Christian. Uh, my mother took me to church, Sunday school, for many years. And when I was 17, I quit the church because I read the, uh, the list of beliefs and I did not agree with them. I remember nothing from going to church except one line from the Gospels where, where Jesus, peace be upon him, said, not my will be done, O Lord, thy will be done. That was the essence of Islam, Taslim, surrender to the will of God. When did you hear about Islam or Sufism? Well, I went to college in Vermont and I studied the mysticism of, of all world traditions. And I was most attracted to uh, the devotional prayer oriented monotheistic mystical traditions. And was Tasawwuf one of those studied? I read a few quotes about Sufism, but not too many. In uh, 1975, I discovered Rumi's Masnavi and I read it in English translation from cover to cover. I felt that this was the greatest work of religious mysticism that I had ever encountered. In 1980, I began teaching myself Persian so I could read the Masnavi in the original. I met a professor of Persian literature in Berkeley. He was an Afghan, and his native language is Persian. And uh, I asked him to help me translate a few quatrains, and we, he did so. And then he said, let's translate all of them. About 2,000 quatrains attributed to Rumi. We spent the next 20 years in our spare time translating. You heard of, of Sufism and you joined the Universalist Sufi group. How did you make the transition from the Universalist American group to the Mevlevi Tariq? I was in a Universalist Sufi group in Los Angeles and our teacher had been to Turkey a few years before and had met a, an elderly Mevlevi sheikh in Konya, Turkey. And our teacher invited the elderly sheikh to come from Konya to Los Angeles, and he did. He initiated me as a Mevlevi seminar. I'd already been whirling for a zikr that we had uh, every Thursday night. Then when the, sh the Mevlevi sheikh came from Turkey, he put a, a Mevlevi hat, tall hat, on my head and sang some prayers. And I, I was initiated as a Mevlevi whirling dervish. I, I've been a Mevlevi ever since then. I, I had resistance to Islam for some years, but I made friends with some American converts that belonged to different Sufi orders in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I used to go to the zikr chanting, Remembrance of God. And I loved uh, chanting zikr in groups with others, other Sufis. And, and I began praying with them, doing the namaz or salat. Eventually, I concluded that if I wanted to really was sincere about becoming a dervish, all the dervishes of the past centuries had been devout Muslims. And I converted to Islam in 1984. So a lot, many people who are Westerners prefer Sufism without the Islam. And many people from the East, particularly from my country, they, they kind of view Sufism as this last refuge of kind of their spirituality, but without Islam. So there's always this tension. You know, on one hand, you have the, the Westerners who view Islam as foreign. They don't want Islam and the Sufism. And the Easterners who, when they think of Islam, they think of, you know, sheikhs and things like that. It reminds me, I had a cousin in Iran say, you know, Rumi used to be an Ayatollah, but then Shams made him become a, an Arif, an Gnostic. <laughs> Rumi was an advanced mystic before he met Shams. He had a previous teacher that was the, the main disciple of his father, Sayyid Bahanad in Muhattiq Termizi. And, and Rumi uh, studied advanced Sufism with him for some seven years before Shams came. Shams met him. Rumi was, was not just a theologian, as some books say, but he was an advanced mystic and therefore very more suitable for what Shams was looking for. When you joined Islam at the time in the United States, 
What was the Muslim community like? I went every Friday to the to the Friday prayers, and I went to different mosques. I felt welcome wherever I, wherever I went, and they were mostly ethnic mosques dominated by Arab brothers and sisters or other ethnic communities, and uh, I enjoyed that. There were a few mosques had a, a nice mixture of members from different cultures. The the different Muslim experiences here kind of allow you to take a deep dive into another culture without having to leave. You go to the Friday Friday prayers at a Vietnamese mosque in San Francisco. Wow, Vietnamese. Were they converts or is there a native population that I had not heard of? You have not heard of the, of the ethnic group. I had no idea that there was even ethnic Muslims in Vietnam. And, and how big a center was this? Was a Small. Islam spread to Southeast Asia through uh, traders from the Middle East and uh, spread all through the Philippines and Malaysia and so on and so forth, and including Vietnam. You began to teach yourself Persian. I'm interested to hear, you know, about that journey and, and learning the, the Persian language. I mean, that was a time before online learning and all kinds of resources. How was it to learn Persian then? Well, I studied several Persian grammars pretty thoroughly back and forth several times over. And then I began with the, the first page of the Masnavi, scanned the, uh, the English translation, and I reviewed the Persian, and gradually I... I became more and more familiar with, with Persian words. It was uh, not hard to learn to read Persian Arabic letters. Every night be- before I went to sleep, I, I read some passages of the Masnavi until I made my way through it a second time. After a few years of reading the Masnavi before bed, I opened the Quran and I, I saw so many words that I recognized from the Masnavi. And so then I started teaching myself to read Quran in the same way, using the same method. Poets rarely become popular outside of their linguistic and cultural sphere. So sometimes you see poets break out of their linguistic sphere, like Dante's uh, Inferno, for example, but not outside of their uh, cultural sphere. So the language is Italian, it's not English, but all the, you know, the analogies and the characters and the biblical references, they map easily into the English language. And the same can be said for French literature, German, even Russian, really. I mean, Russian is... Russian culture is very different, but in in a way, because they're part of Christendom, you can kind of read it in translation and relate to it. But Rumi has a double barrier, right? He's not only from a different language, a different age, maybe a third, but from a different religion and culture. So how is it that Rumi is kind of almost the only poet who really enjoys this status? I can't think of any poet that, that is famous outside of his culture and religion and time period and not only famous, but really best-selling like Rumi. I mean, Rumi is just way ahead of the others. Maybe if you go into a translation section of Barnes & Noble, you'll find an obscure book by the Buddha or maybe an obscure book of some sages sayings. But no one like Rumi. I mean, you see Rumi quotes everywhere now. Why do you think Rumi has kind of broken down all of these boundaries and come to the heart of a very kind of different culture when you when you really sit down and consider you know, how different 12th century Konya and 21st century America is? Rumi represents beautiful, inspiring example of mystical love. The mystical dimension is something that is lacking in Western culture. Mysticism is practiced in some monasteries and a uh, few mystical orders. It's not available to the common person. Mysticism never caught on in, in Protestant Christianity. And I believe there's a, been a thirst for uh, mystical love, which has to do with... Uh, are being uh, united in, in spirit, human beings being united in soul and spirit, sharing love for a greater human identity is what I'm calling mystical. Rumi's poetry, no matter how badly interpreted, this mystical love quality comes through. You mentioned that Rumi comes from a long tradition. Uh, there's a famous quote, Sanoi ruh bud va ator do u, ma az peye sanoi o ator Sanoi Ghaznavi, who was one of the earliest Sufi poets who wrote at the quantity of Rumi and Attar, was the soul. And Attar has two eyes. And we came after, after Sanoi and Attar. And there's another quote, and something like, Attar hafvadiye eshra kashf kar, ma hanuz andar khamiye kuche istadeim. Which means, Attar uncovered the seven wadis of love, and we are still standing in the bend of a single alley. We haven't even entered the desert, we're still in the city. So this kind of shows, again, it's, it's not by Rumi, but it's but in the imagination of people it is. And it says something. It shows that he's part of a greater tradition. 
but it seems like he has outshined everyone in the tradition. Do you have any thoughts as to why Rumi has even outshined people he considered his elders or his teachers? I think it's the, the grace of God. Uh, uh, Attar and Sanai were, were certainly members of the, the love, mystical love school of Subism. He was very influenced by Sanai because his first Subi teacher, Sidi Burhanuddin, was quoting Sanai all the time. And Rumi's disciples were reading Attar's poetic masterpieces. That, that inspired Rumi to compose his own Mathnawi based on elements of Attar and Senai. And I believe he composed it for his disciples and for the world. I was wondering if you had any thoughts as to why mysticism never took hold in the Protestant West. Well, there were some great uh, early Protestant mystics, Jonathan Fox, founded the Quakers. Uh, but it never really caught on. Protestant Christians were uh, generally suspicious of mysticism. What was Rumi's milieu like? I think the, the most amazing thing is that the uh, Turks were invading the West for centuries, and they, they didn't have much a culture of their own. And they very wisely adopted Persian language and Persian culture. So you have for centuries what's called the Seljuk Turkish Empire. The language of the mosques was, of course, Arabic, but the language of literature and culture and, and often everyday life was Persian. So Rumi came from the far eastern Persian-speaking area of the world, eastern Afghanistan, and he came to the westernmost area where, where Persian language and culture was followed in Turkey because the, the Seljuks invaded Turkey and they established power centers in Turkey, where amazingly, the predominant language was Persian. So Rumi's family came from the far eastern Persian-speaking area to the far western Persian-speaking area, as did many other scholars. And so here he was in, in Turkey, or Anatolia, and uh, there was a constant warfare. The Anatolian Seljuk Turkish were fighting uh, Georgians, they were fighting Mongols, they were fighting Crusaders, they were fighting the... Uh, Byzantines, and they created an area uh, centered in Konya, which was fairly peaceful. Eventually, the Mongols came and tore down the walls of Konya, but they, they didn't slaughter the inhabitants of Konya. This happened during Rumi's lifetime. It's believed that the Mongols were superstitiously afraid of doing anything to harm Rumi. A lot of warfare and chaos, but a, a great, an amazing amount of scholarship and and practice of, of Islamic mysticism. The Mongols were paranoid of harming Rumi. So could it be that Rumi saved the residents of Konya? And my second question is, why were they paranoid? How had they heard of him? Was his fame that widespread? They heard that there was a great saint in Konya, and they, they were reluctant to offend that great saint. Were they Muslim at the time, the Mongols, or did they just have a respect generally? No, they were not. But they were uh, wary of... Uh, earning the anger of, of saints. So they, they just tore down the walls of Konya and did not kill the inhabitants. They made an agreement with a, a regent to rule in, in their stead. When Rumi entered Konya, was it still majority Greek and Christian, Assyrian, or had it kind of taken an Islamic character by the time that he arrived? It had definitely taken an Islamic character. The Seljuks had been ruling that part of Anatolia for several centuries. As long as we're on the timeline of his life, what is your take on the stories about Rumi encountering Shams? Do you find one particularly more convincing? I know that... I re reviewed those stories in my, my introduction to the quatrains of Rumi, summarized and translated uh, the main stories. And uh, I've also uh, have a quotation from Shams himself in, in what's called the Discourses of Shams, Makala de Shamsi Tabrizi. He summarizes the, the dialogue between them. P predominantly, the accounts say that Rumi answered that Muhammad was greater than Bayezid Bistami. Bayezid was satisfied when he reached a certain level of mystical development, whereas Muhammad was thirsty, thirsty for higher, higher, and higher uh, station. Are you partial to a story about the disappearance of Sham? There's three stories and a grave to match every story. Some say that he was murdered by followers or family or friends of Rumi and buried uh, in a well that purported grave exists today. And some say that he wandered off. It's unclear if he went back home or not. Aflaki claimed that Sultan Veled, Rumi's son, had a dream. Shams appeared and said, they, they killed me and threw my body down a well. Sultan Veled and some other companions removed the body, perfumed it, and buried it. 
next to the architect and builder of the of the madrasa or college that, that Rumi had. The story is full of holes because Sultan Vlad Rumi's son, in his books, never mentioned having such a dream. And the builder, a very respected Medlevi, uh, was buried there, but, but he died some over 12 years after Shams final disappearance. And also in the discourses of Shams, he hints that he left deliberately. He said Rumi was in too much in awe of him, that he had to leave so that Rumi, who was a master, could become a great master. And that's what I believe. Because Rumi said that separate, separation cooks. And Sham said, I, I could live anywhere. I could live in Istanbul. I could live in Tabriz. Everything I do is for, for your sake. And personally, I've been to the Mosque of Shams for many years, starting in 1977, and I have never felt the spiritual presence of Shams at that mosque. And I believe that the, the person buried there is the, the architect, uh, Gahar Tash. And uh, that's who I believe is buried there. But the Mevlevis believed Aflaki's story about the well. They've done reconstruction on that mosque, and they didn't find anything in the well. So as far as I know, there's one remains of one person, that is Gohar Tash, the, the uh, architect and builder of the madrasa that used to be there. After Shams's disappearance, is that when Rumi begins composing the Divan of Shams? We're talking about the final disappearance of Shams, but he left about a year before and went to Syria. And Rumi found out that he was in Syria and sent his son, Sultan Vlad, to bring him back. And he was writing to love poems addressed to Shams then. And I believe he was writing, composing poetry long before, but there's no evidence of that. So it could be that some of the ghazals that we find, perhaps the ones that don't have the shams, tabriz, tachalos, maybe the ones that say khamush, or ones without a tachalos, it could be, or maybe the quatrains, that some of them, or many of them, date back to before the appearance and disappearance of shams. I believe so, yes. Just given the volume of poems, that seems plausible to me as well. I mean, not to say that he couldn't have composed them all, but... Again, just the, considering the sheer volume, it, it just seems more likely that they weren't all composed towards the end of his life. I've heard some describe the process of Rumi composing the Ghazals after the disappearance of Shams in a very particular fashion. They say that he wouldn't write them down as a normal, uh, I, I don't want to say abnormal, but a, a usual poet would, but that he would go into a hall and start chanting the poetry and his disciples who followed him around would write down the poetry as they heard it. It's just speculated. All we know is that he that he didn't write down his, his ghazals or, or any of his poems, but he composed them on the spot in a state of inspiration. Disciples wrote them down. I believe he, he may have uh, been stepping according to the, the poetic meter or vazen. He may have been stepping according to that beat. One of them was da 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 He's very famous for using these meters. They call them chakkoshi in Persian, hammer meters. Dun, 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 dun. Like as if you're hammering a nail, it has a very predictable rhythm. Yes, there, there, there are 20, 23 major poetic meters. One of the collections is Divan. Is all the ghazals are arranged according to the 23 meters. And I believe that these ghazals were sung during the Sama, uh, ecstatic movement sessions where mystical music and mis mystical, mystical poetry was recited. And I believe that he composed a huge amount of his ghazals to be recited during these mystical movement musical sessions. Yes, I call it the old Persian Sama, because it was different when the, the Rumi orders, the Mevlevi orders, it became more and more Turkish, then it became ceremonial and focused on whirling. But originally these ecstatic movement music sessions were completely spontaneous, and whirling was one of many movements that took place. The Turks loved ritual and created a whirling ritual that's exactly the same in each session. I've noticed the Mevli Tariqa doesn't have a big emphasis on this silsila going all the way back to the Prophet. Not to say they don't have it, I mean, please educate me, but it doesn't seem like that's very prominent. Unlike other Sufi orders, which you know they shift from location to location, uh, the Mevlevis have stuck in Konya and they've also remained within the same family as well. Early Mevlevis, soon after Mevlana's time, and his uh, hagiographers, 
Sepah, uh, Salar, and Aflaki, they have a succession of masters list at the end of their books. It goes through Mevlana's father, his grandfather's great-grandfather, and then down to Ali, just like the other Sufi orders. But it's rather artificial because it continues through Mevlana's, through his son's grandson's the leader of the Mevlevi Sufi order has always been a direct descendant of Mevlana, not in the more common Sufi lineages where the most advanced student becomes the next sheikh. So it's different in that respect. Prominent because of its connection with Rumi. That's what makes it special. Aside from that, it's known for its refinement of culture, of studying Masnavi, calligraphy, and music. And, uh, so it represents the highest in culture and, and religion. Could you enlighten us a bit about the modern history of the Mevlevis? The Ottoman Empire was defeated in World War I, and they, they wanted to blame. One of the groups that they blamed was the Sufis, which they regarded as superstitious, lazy people that held back you know, Turkey from being a greater nation. So in 1925, all Sufi orders were declared illegal. So that's 100 years ago. The Mevlevi order has been illegal for 100 years. And, but they, in the 1950s, they allowed the, the whirling prayer ceremony to be, begin again once a year on the anniversary of Rumi's death, December 17, but as a tourist event only. And it, it had been done privately as the, the weekly Remembrance of God ceremony for each Mevlevi community. That was banned. It was only allowed on a stage in a theater for tourists. But ironically, the whirling prayer performance helped keep the Mevlevi tradition going because each generation knows less than the generation before. And so the Mevlevi tradition has become quite weak. But uh, we, we really need the, the whirling prayer ceremony as corrupted and as performance and tourist oriented as it is. We need that whirling prayer ceremony to survive as a Sufi order, I believe. The music of the Whirling Prayer Ceremony is hauntingly beautiful. Composers have selected verse in Persian of, from Mevlana, seldom known what, what these verses are because they're sung in a thick Turkish accent by people that don't know the meaning. But Mevlana's poet, poems, uh, verses are in the, the, the Whirling Prayer Ceremony, as well as very profound and beautiful musical compositions. What is the significance of music? Well, it's, it's based on what I call the, the, the ancient Persian Sama, or ecstatic movement gathering, where mystical music, mystical poems, and were all combined. Music in Islamic culture has always been controversial, and the Sama was controversial for many centuries. In the, the discourses of Shamsi Tabrizi, he says that most people are forbidden to participate in the Sama because they would indulge in excited sensations. Sema is required for the, the advanced mystics who need it as a, as a kind of mystical food for their souls. Do you accept this sober and drunk Sufism categorization? And if so, or if not, how would you define the Mevlevi tariqah with respect to that? Well, in the Mevlevi order, every Thursday night, they would do the, the whirling prayer ceremony privately in a special whirling Sema hall taught in Sufism that to display one's spirituality is to tempt hypocrisy. There's a whirling prayer ceremony on a stage. The whirlers are more tempted <clears throat> to pretend to be drunk or ecstatic because the audience is looking for that or expecting that. So therefore, that's very bad. And the Nakshbandi tradition is very sober. They don't believe in displaying one's spirituality, rather the opposite. They they would rather incur criticism or blame than praise, which they believe is da damaging to spiritual development. And the Mevlevis are, are fairly sober in comparison. They have only a very short zikr that they do several times a day, Allah, 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 in a group in, the, in when they were uh, living in, in buildings. So the Mevlevis have never had a loud, open zikr where the public can join in and it goes on for hours and hours like the Qadri and the Faidu. Do you believe that is inherited from Molana himself, or is that something that developed after the fact? It's well known that Mevlana was crazy ecstatic for a number of years. Uh, 
that is not imitated or that is not taught that that is uh, what we should strive for. I think it's regarded as something special to Mevlana's spiritual development. Let's say when Shamsa Tabrizi departed for the second time, it, it seems Mevlana must have had a body of students. Could we call them the early Mevlevis? Well, he had other people train the disciples to be dervishes. He was composing poetry and being ecstatic. And after he died, his son was doing the same thing, composing vast amounts of poetry while other people were training the Mevlevis. Did it take form as a formal Sufi order under the guidance of Sultan Valad? I think it was very gradual. They basically carried on Mevlana Rumi's practices. After Juma prayer, there would be a, an, a spiritual music poetry movement session. Some people were appointed to be sheikhs in other cities. There was great care to protect Mevlana's Masnavi and, and his Ghazal poems, make sure the manuscripts were copied correctly. And it was a very gradual development. Uh, but it was, what's not realized is that it was a Persian, a Persian Suvi order. It was several centuries later that it gradually became more and more a Turkish Suvi order. So the names of the clothing and the names of many key Mevlevi terms are Persian because it started out as a, as a Persian Sufi order. When you say Persian and Turkish, does that mean that the order kind of takes on the characteristics or the culture or the attitudes and practices of Persian-speaking people, then slowly, as it is more nativized and maybe the population is more Turkified, that it takes on those characteristics? Is, is that what you mean? Yeah, well, there was a kind of a common Sufi doctrine and group of practices throughout uh, the Persian-speaking Sufi cultures. That continued after Mevlana died. Uh, followers continued uh, following and teaching and practicing uh, basically Sunni Persian Sufism that was widespread throughout that part of the world. Uh, gradually, it became more and more Turkish. Finally, very little Persian was spoken, or the only Persian that was heard was when Me Mevlana's verses were recited. What is your take on, on Rumi's identity, so to speak? I would call him a Tajik from the culture of what's now Eastern Afghanistan. It had uh, eth ethnic groups that were in an area between India and Persia. I don't believe he looked like any of the portraits that have been made of, uh, of him looking more European. His native language was certainly Persian. He, he came from a Persian-speaking family. His father's book is in Persian. All of his writings are in Persian, except for a few Greek and Turkish verse, half verses. His son and grandson all wrote in Persian. It was a Persian-speaking family. Right. And he, in so many words, calls himself Tajik, you know, here and there in his quatrains and his ghazals, and the Masnav refers to himself uh, as such. Do you think he would have looked akin to the people from modern-day Central Asia? I would think he would look more like a Tajik minus Mongol ancestry. From the biographies of Rumi's life, what is your favorite episode? Or maybe episodes, if you can't uh, pick one. Well, I, I'll choose one one story for its significance. It's in the earlier biography by Sepa Salar. Rumi's disciple, Salahuddin, the goldsmith, was hammering some gold plate in his shop. And Sepa Salar said that Rumi appeared in his shop and was doing sema, or ecstatic, spiritually inspired movements. The goldsmiths kept on hammering because he saw that Rumi was moving to the beat of the hammer. So he kept hammering the gold plate, even though that risked destroying the gold plate. And Flocky took this story and grossly exaggerated it. He said that Rumi heard the, the beat of the hammer. Slaudin had uh, assistant goldsmiths. That they all, he ordered them to keep hammering. Mevlana was whirling in the middle of the street. His disciples were, were whirling. Ghazal singers showed up. All of the gold beating implements, all the hammers, the anvil, everything turned to pure gold. I'm mentioning this story because I think this story may have been the origin of Rumi's reputation as the first whirling dervish. Uh, the emphasis on whirling is uh, prominent with Rumi. The Sema, the ancient Persian Sema, becoming a Turkish whirling ritual. 
I believe that all that may have originated in Aflaki's grossly exaggerated miracle story. Because when it says that, it says that Rumi did Sema in a Salavadin shop, many Turkish scholars and others think that Sema means only whirling, or it was just one of many ecstatic movements. And besides, a Salavadin shop was probably tiny, and there wasn't, a, wasn't room for him to whirl inside of it. He was probably uh, stopping his feet, clapping his hands. What's your favorite Masnavi passage? I selected two from my website, daralmasnavi.org. Love sickness is clearly shown by the heart's misery. There is no sickness like the sickness of the heart. The sickness of the lover is distinct from all other illnesses. Love is the astrolabe of the secrets of God. Whether being a lover is from this or that origin, eventually it is our guide to that divine origin. Whatever I say about love in regard to description and explanation, when I reach love itself, I am ashamed of that inadequate description. For although the explanation of the tongue is an excellent illuminator, yet love expressed without the tongue is much clearer. When the pen was hurrying, in writing descriptions, when it reached love, it shattered against itself. In attempting to its explanation, the intellect is laid down like a donkey, stuck helplessly in the mud. Only love itself spoke the real explanation of both love and being in love. The sun is the demonstration of the sun. If you need proof, seek it from the sun itself and don't turn your face away. Let's focus on mystical love and that love is beyond the intellect and dogma and explanations and ideation. And that, that's my definition of mysticism is that a spiritual experience is beyond the, the ordinary mind, thoughts, concepts, and beliefs. But I like to add music when, I, when I'm reciting Mevlana's verses and I have different melodies for different types of poem, but for the Masnavi, I would sing what was one verse. Chun talam and der nevish dan mi shetoft. Chun be ishka mad kalam her chad shekoft. And that way I feel that I can get, go more deeply into the, the rhythm and the, the rhyme and the, and the, the language and the, the feeling that is Rumi's words. You said there was a second favorite passage from the Masnavi. If we could also hear that one. Well, that's the famous, listen to the reed flute, how it is complaining. It is telling about separations, saying, ever since I was severed from the reed field, men and women have lamented in the presence of my shrill cries. But I want a heart which is torn, torn from separation, so that I may explain the pain of yearning. Anyone who has remained far from his roots seeks a return to the time of his union. I lamented in every gathering. I associated with those in bad or happy circumstances. But everyone became my friend from his own opinion. He did not seek my secrets from within me. And this is how I sing the first five verses of the Masnavi. and Pause to your rules, go to Vaslechish. What he wants to share is beyond opinion, belief, dogma, interpretation. That people uh, hear the, the reed flutes yearning for union with, with, with the divine, and they're hearing their own yearning for uh, fame or wealth or, or what have you, falsely appreciating the reed flutes yearning. To return to the divine origin, they're interpreting according to their own personal yearnings. That's why Shamsi Tabriz used to say uh, people are reading from their own book. They're not 
listening to what I have to say. What about your favorite ghazal or ghazals? Well, that would be, uh, come to the source of your own self. How much longer will you travel backwards? Don't go into unbelief and denial, but come to true religion. See the sweet drink within the poison and come to the poison. Come at last to the source of the source of your own self. Even though you are of the earth in form, still you are the fine spiritual thread made of the very substance of certainty. You are the trusted guardian of the treasury of the light of God. Come at last to the source of the source of your own self. Know that when you have bound yourself to selflessness, you will escape from attachment to selfness. And then you will leap away from the bonds of a thousand traps. Come at last to the source of the source of your own self. The meter is dot da 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 Vez bende hazar dama jasti. Acher tobe asle asle chisha. I know you're going to ask me about quatrains. Please, yes. This quatrain uh, is my favorite quatrain. And it is the quatrain that's, that's written in Persian, lightly printed, the translation at the bottom of the book. And that's because of how special uh, Rumi's tomb is for me. When I first stood in front of Rumi's tomb in 1977, I felt it was a, a fountain of divine love. I've been going many years, gone maybe 30 times to Rumi's tomb, and whenever I stand before it, I, I go into an altered state of consciousness. It's very uh, serene and spiritually joyous. And this is uh, my translation. The one who passes by my tomb will become spiritually drunk. And if he stops there, he will become drunk forever. If he goes to the ocean, the ocean and ship's masts will become drunk. And if he goes into the earth, his grave and burial niche will become drunk. Dar Bahravado Bahramad Mas Shavad Dar Hok Ravad Guru Lahad Mas Shavad. So I love that, and you can appreciate why it means so much to me. When you read Rumi's quatrains, you get a different sense than you get in his Masnavi. Or his ghazals. When you read the Masnavi, sometimes you feel you're a grandson with your grandfather and he's imparting life lessons to you. When you read the ghazals, you feel like you're getting a window into spiritual experiences. When you read the quatrains, you get a personal window into Rumi. That's true. Yeah, he talks about the celebration of the end of the fasting month in very ordinary terms, the food that they eat. Yeah, it does have that everyday quality. There is this common problem of misattribution in quatrains. I have I have a whole, a whole chapter of about maybe 120 quatrains that I have identified as not being Rumi, as being by uh, Senai or Attar. I spent a huge amount of time like going through Senai's divan, discovering quatrains that were in Rumi's divan that belonged to the earlier poet Senai. So I have a, a major chapter that separates those, uh, sometimes called floating quatrains. Uh, it could be that, that, that Rumi was reciting an earlier quatrain composed by an earlier poet, and everyone knew it, uh, but that over time he lost that awareness and thought it was one of his quatrains. Shamsi Tabriz uh, fre frequently, frequently quoted quatrains, but he did not, uh, of course, compose any poems of his own. There are many ghazals that are attributed to Rumi, but not by him. So I don't know how much you've come across this. Uh, I have come across a lot of it. It would be a whole other discussion. It's called fake Rumi poems and verses. Well, I get emails from all over the world asking, uh, is this authentic? Can you, can you send me the original Persian? And I write back and I say, this is not authentic. There's one level where there's an English poem that just has no authenticity. But then there's some Persian poems that aren't by Rumi, but then those become 
translations. Not Muslim, not Jewish, not Christian, not any belief system. Yes, that's true. There, there is a, a very famous quatrain that has been claimed to have been by Rumi. Return in repentance, return. Whatsoever you are, return. Even if you are an unbeliever or a magian or an idol worshiper, return. This court of ours is not a court of despair. Even if you have broken your repentance a hundred times, return. And that was by composed by an earlier poet, Abu Sa'id ibn Khair. For decades, it was believed to be Rumi's famous verse, but it was never his verse. Many people believe that, that was the essence of Rumi's teaching. My interpretation is that, that poem was written a couple of centuries before Mevlana's time, when there were more Zoroastrians in Persia. The meaning of the quatrain was, uh, even if you, you revert to some of your Zoroastrian worship, you're welcome to come back to the Sufi circle. Whereas in Mevlana's time, Sufi circles were more strict about people returning if they made the same mistakes over and over. Sufis are, are famous for converting the local populace into Islam through Sufism in many parts of the world. The same thing happened in Anatolia and Persia. The Sufis, because of their exceptional tolerance and welcoming, loving nature, encouraged many groups of people in di different lands, taught them the beauty of Islam. Alhamdulillah. Another viewer asked, what is your favorite Quran surah? Well, that would be the surah in Shirah. Have we not expanded your heart? And uh, with hardship comes ease. It ends with, to thy Lord, turn all of your desire and yearning. Another viewer asked, How does your spiritual state change when reading or translating Rumi? It's difficult to say. Uh, as I said, that I, I like to follow, recite Rumi's verses according to the poetic meter. And I like to sing a melody that I've composed for different types of poems, or to go deeper into it. And the meaning, even the meaning in English, is inspiring. I believe it, it feeds my soul a certain type of spiritual food somehow, mysteriously. Because I feel elevated that, that our interpretation of, of the quatrains is according to a mystical path of Sufism called Fana or annihilation. The, the Sufi disciple loses his self consciousness in a state of disappearing into the spiritual presence of the Sheikh. And that's called annihilation in the Sheikh, uh, further stages uh, along the path leading to annihilation in God, Fana Fillah. And I've interpreted Rumi's composing ghazals and quatrains as being the stage of disappearance into the being of his sheikh, Shandra Tabrif. In the Divan poems, he sees the beauty of his master everywhere. But in the Masnavi, I believe he's gone into a higher stage of Thanaf Billah, because in the Masnavi, the name of Shandra Tabrif is only mentioned three times. He went through the, the stage of annihilation in, in his sheikh, and then attained uh, annihilation in God, because in the Mathnawi, of course, he's viewing everything beautiful as an attribute of God as the divine beloved. From uh, Al-Jahiz and his Kitab Al-Hayawan, he says, poetry, sher, is untranslatable. It cannot be transferred from one language into another. Translation breaks its metrical arrangements, nazm, and spoils the rhythm, wazn, ruins aesthetics, husn, and flattens the element of wonder. Translation turns poetry into prose, and prose originally written as such is preferred over what has been turned into prose as a result of translating verse. So given that, do you think translation breaks a poem or destroys a poem as has been described? I think your quote is completely true. But if we were such a purist, then we wouldn't try to translate Rumi's verses at all. We would just learn Persian and not be involved in translation. I believe there's a divine grace 
and Mevlana's poetry that comes through, as we've said earlier, even by people that don't know Persian, that go into a reverie of their own imagination and portray Rumi as not as what he actually said in Festus can be translated accurately into English, but some of these poets have an accurate English translation to begin with, and then, then they go off and make their own interpretation and call that their Rumi translation. When How can it be a translation when it's, they don't know another language? But still something comes through of, of Rumi's mystical love. On the one hand, translation can be too literal, and that's one of the issues that I struggle with. My mission has been to try to portray what exactly is as accurately as I can with, with the help of my collaborator, Dr. Ravan Farhadi, to, in contrast to the people that just make up what they want Rumi to say to, to Americans, I want people to have a book to know what Rumi did say uh, as accurately, what the idioms meant, and so on and so forth, even though it may be too, too literal and rigid for some. Next question was, what challenges do you face in translation? I struggle with uh, being too literal. Being too literal is a mistake. Uh, it's too distracting. It's better to come up with a metaphor that's Western that expresses the same concept. But I struggle with that. I put words that are not translations of words, of Rumi's words, I put those words in parentheses. So that you, if you look at one of my translations, you know what the literal meaning is and, and you know what's been added to, to smooth it out and make it easier to read. Most Rumi translators shun putting things in parentheses because uh, that's what Nicholson did in the, in the 20s and 30s and became too distracting. On one hand, if it's too literal, you know, there's really no point in reading the translation. But then if it's too poetic, sometimes you feel like you're missing a bit. That's why I believe in, in providing the reader with explanatory footnotes. Many people may skip those, but those that are curious might appreciate uh, more explanation. At least it's, uh, more explanation is available. The second to last question, if you had to summarize the kernel of Rumi's teachings, how would you do so? I know it's, it's asking a, a lot. Rumi comes from the Sufi school of divine love. The emphasis is on seeing, viewing God as the, the beloved, the worshiper as the lover. And this puts a mystical path in a whole different universe than a Salafi or fundamentalist view of God as judge only. And... A second theme in Rumi is the difference between appearance and the husk and the kernel, what he calls the surat, the, the outward form, and the matna, the inward reality or meaning. And he, he constantly throughout his poetry is urging the reader to look for the, the inside meaning and not be led astray by the outer husk. What advice do you have for Rumi seekers? Many people have begun with uh, reading Coleman Barks's versions, even though they're his imaginings of what he would like Rumi to say uh, rather than what Rumi has said in, in clear English translation. But many people have been inspired uh, and, and become lovers of Rumi through Coleman Barks's versions and interpretations. Jaweed Mujadidi's rhyme translation is an excellent way to start reading the, the Masnavi. Uh, although I, I've estimated that maybe a third of the meaning of the original is lost by the requirement to rhyme. Still, the musicality, the, uh, the rhythm, the rhyme, a very good way to begin learning about Rumi's world of divine love. A certain proportion of people, readers will want to go deeper. They, they'll want to read a more accurate translation. I have a website called uh, Masnavi. Dot net that has Nicholson's entire translation. And many times I, I find that a version of Rumi's verses to be quite attractive. Let the beauty of love be the beauty you do, that, that sort of thing. The original, even though in a, a kind of a stilted, academic sounding translation, is oftentimes much more profound in its wisdom. So I would put that out as a thought. While we're talking about translations, I, I would recommend. The new translation of Masnavi by Alan Williams uh, has a poetic meter. It's a, an accurate translation. He's published books one and two of Masnavi, and he's almost finished with book three. 
and uh, it follows iambic pentameter, da 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 and it's a very pleasant way, and it's accurate in contemporary English. In my view, the, uh, the Masnavi translation for the coming century, viewing Nicholson's translation as the translation of Masnavi for the last century. Ustad Gamar, thank you so much, and uh, we're very much indebted to your work at Dottal Masnavi and Masnavi.net. You know, all those links will be found in the description of this video. We're very lucky to be in your presence virtually. If you have uh, no other thoughts, then uh, we'd just like to end with a, a warm thank you. And God protect you. Khura Hafez. Salamu alaikum. Rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Alaikum as-salam wa khudafiz.